Good morning. Good morning. Rocky, it's class time now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third session of the Book of Romans. Um, the sign up for roll is in the back. If you did the homework, turn it in in the back. And then I also have notes. Does anyone not have notes? Get the notes in the back. All right. Now, if we didn't put our homework in our folder, can we bring it? All right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and open us up in prayer. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 today. Lord willing, we'll do both chapters. Okay, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. Um, I just, again, thank you for always being faithful to your word, Lord. We just, all the needs that are in the body, Lord, our sisters that are, that, that are home not feeling good, and um, just different brothers that are in the hospital and things going on, Lord. We lift all this up, we lift all them up to you. Um, add to these notes and take away from them as you see fit, Lord. And I just pray we would just grow today by being in your word. Go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 is our text today. You'll remember Romans chapter 5 begins with the first word being therefore. Whenever we see the word therefore, it's always, it's, yes, it's because, of, therefore, what is, there, what is it therefore, right? Um, there was a joke there, but I can't remember it. So therefore, um, because of everything, that was a joke, because of everything that was said beforehand, therefore, tying all the thoughts in previous to what was written, therefore, having been justified by faith. So in chapter 4 and chapter 3 and 4, God talks about, um, he defends his judgment. What is the advantage of a, of a Jew? What do they have? What advantage do they have? And how to them were chiefly committed the oracles of God. And in verses chapter three, verses nine through twenty, we're just doing a quick recap because it's been three weeks. From chapter three, verses nine through twenty, he talks about how we've all sinned, we've all fallen short by the glory of God. And he, he says in chapter three, verse twenty, by the deeds of the flesh, no, no, no one will be justified. In his sight, for by the not for the knowledge, the purpose of the law is the knowledge of sin. And also in chapter three, how righteousness comes through faith, using Abraham, how he's justified by faith. And our promise of faith of righteousness is granted through faith. So justification, righteousness, and imputed were our three vocabulary words for when we met last time. So I have a definition of justification because it says in verse 5, therefore having been justified by faith and this is from Easton's Dictionary if any of you use Blue Letter Bible I can show you how to get to this, it's very easy maybe one time I'll put it up here and walk you through it, I'll do, I'll do that before we this class is over yeah, we'll do that um, so justification, this is how Easton's Bible Dictionary describes it it is the judicial act of God by which he pardons all the sins of those, of those who believe in Christ and accounts, accepts, and treats them as righteous. So it's a judicial act of God in which he pardons all of our sins of those who believe in Christ. Obviously, we have to believe in Christ because any other way is a work of the flesh. And by, as I said in Galatians 3.20, that no flesh will be justified in his sight. All our sins are pardoned if we believe in Christ. He accounts, accepts, and treats us as righteousness, as righteous. And for some reason, I keep going about the fact by the fact that we are not made righteous. We're treated as righteous. And I believe that's an important distinction because it speaks of God's grace covering us. 
it speaks of God's, the blood of Christ covering us in salvation. So therefore, having been justified by faith, Ephesians 2, 8, having been justified by faith, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So we are justified by the faith, which in, which in of itself is a gift of God. We now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The words that the Holy Spirit uses here are very specific, and they're directed in a very, a very specific specific reason for speaking to the truth of the theology of what it's saying, that our peace with God only can come through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have justified by faith. The faith that we have is a gift of God, not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 9 of Ephesians 2 says, through whom... Well, hold on, let me slow down here. So by faith. So the faith that we have, God gives us. Romans chapter 12. We'll go on to the next. I almost jumped the gun there on something. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Because we understand, it's really important to understand that faith is indeed a gift of God. That we cannot gin up more faith of ourselves to make ourselves more ready to serve God more effectively in the way that he calls us. He gives us the faith to do that. And he says here in Romans 12, 3, and it's on your notes, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. I'm really filled with faith. You should check me out, right? But to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God deals that faith to us that we have. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse at, at 12, he, he's saying verse 14 is what we came here before, but came here for, but he's saying in verse 12, he thanks God. Christ Jesus, who enabled him, counted me faithful, putting him into ministry, um, even though he was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, he obtained it in mercy, mercy. He obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And he says, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am in chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I just wanted to read 16. It's not directly related to what we're talking about, but it's just a good aside that by the faith, the grace that God has given him, he's enabled him with long suffering to be a pattern to other believers. So God, in verse 14 of 1 Timothy 1.14, the grace of the Lord is exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And so if we lack faith, if we feel like in a situation we're not trusting God enough, it's very important to confess that to the Lord. Because we are justified by faith and we have peace with God. And so so it's very important because we understand that he deals to us a measure of faith. The faith that he's given us is exceedingly abundant. And we want to be real with God. He wants us to grow, always grow in trusting him. So be honest before him. It's a real snare of the flesh in that situation in which we might be lacking faith to, to try to effort more towards that, right? And that is a very subtle way to fall back into the flesh. When we're trying to effort more, to, to, more, more towards that, I just need to pray harder. I just need to read more, right? Faith is a gift of God. 
in Mark chapter 9. So we're dealing with, in verse 20, this is a, a father that his son is, um, is possessed. And it said, verse 20, a spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked, how long has this been happening? He says, from childhood. He's often thrown into the fire. But if you, have, but if you can do anything, help us. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father, and this is such a wise thing, and this is a good picture of how we should pray to the Lord. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Right? It's a very potent point of application in those areas of our life. We're justified with faith and we have peace with God. But if we're struggling in a trial or in a situation, it's, Lord, I believe you but there's a part of me that is struggling and doesn't believe you all the way. The part of me that doesn't believe. So in verse 25, it says that Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and saying, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him or enter him no more. Beautiful scripture. So we have peace with God. This justification that we have the judicial act of God in which he pardons all his sins and he accepts us and treats us as righteous brings us to a place of peace with God. Because you're going to see the word enmity later on. Enmity, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a, it's, it speaks of a hatred, it's a division, it's a separation, it's animosity, enmity. So, but now we have a peace with God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Christ himself is our peace. He is our peace. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation. When I think of this scripture, where does your mind go to when Jesus died on the cross? Does it go to the veil that was torn, right? Separating the inner... The, the inner court from the most from the holiest of holies, where the Shekinah glory of, Lo- of the Lord was in the, manifested in the Ark of the Covenant, in which the, the priest could only go in there once a year and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat for the atonement of sins, right? For Yom Kippur, if I'm not mistaken, right? Which we're celebrating today. Um, the Jews are celebrating today. So it's that separation from the very presence of God, that now we can come boldly before the throne of grace. He sits on a throne of grace. In verse 15, so he's, he's, he's broken down the middle wall of separation because he himself is our peace. That goes with, it goes with the thought that we are not made righteous, we are treated as righteous because he himself is our peace. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. The enmity. There's that word enmity. I thought I might have wrote it down, but I defined it to you guys. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. From the two is speaking of both Gentile and Jew. That he might, did you guys catch that? In verse, verse 12, he's abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments, commanded in ordinances, so as to create in, in himself all the works of the law. He's, that's gone. It's trash. It's just a schoolmaster to show us that we missed the mark. To create in himself one new man from the two, speaking of both Jew and Gentile, thus making peace that he might be that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, hatred, or hostility. He put it to death. So, 
the, these first five verses are very special to me personally because it just, it really ministers to me in those times in which we have trials. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through whom, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus, through whom we also have access by faith into what? Into his grace. Understanding the the most elementary principle I can give you guys and how grace operates is that it operates alone by faith. And that faith, faith operates alone by a gift of God that he has given you. Okay? If we don't understand that, we're in danger of walking in the flesh and of our own experiences and abilities, right? Whenever I want to step out and do something for the Lord, there's, I, well, it's important for me to remember um, to, to just, just confess to the Lord, forgive me for my own self-confidence, forgive me for the works of the flesh that believes I can do this, all those things that, that we do, right? Because in my, my job, I have experience and I was trained to do what I do, as you guys are in your jobs. And so I have a, you have a certain level of confidence, but that's a work of the flesh. So that faith, we have access through Jesus, verse 2, we have, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of glory. Faith is act, grace is accessed by faith. Romans eleven six. I've shared this verse with you guys before. It's a very, it says it very clearly what grace is and what grace is not. What works are and what, great, what works are not. Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. They're completely separate. They cannot exist together unless it's works by grace, right? So if by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work, right? Just as James says, to kind of solidify the point in our brains, James says, I will show you my faith by my works, right? So grace is... If it's by works, it's no longer works. And then flip it the same way in the, in the mirror image of it. Work is no longer work if it's by grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 8. This is talking about in the context of giving but I want to isolate this one verse because it's true with regards to grace in general. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able. You ever pray? You ever like in a situation, you go, man, God is able. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Does he leave anything out in in that statement? No. That you're always going to have the full sufficiency of everything you need, all the sufficiency in everything that you do. And in that, you're going to have an abundance uh, of flowing over, Acts 1.8, you know, you, the Holy Spirit coming upon you and flowing over this vessel with which we are, this fleshly vessel, blessing those whom which we're called to serve, whom which we, call, we come in contact with. You have that abundance. He's, he's able to make all grace abound towards you. You're going to always have all sufficiency in all things and may have an abundance for every good work. So back to chapter 5, we access faith into this grace in which we stand. We stand on God's grace. He sits on a throne of grace. We stand in that grace. And because of that, we can do nothing but rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
There's this, these first two verses alone are just so inc- incredibly rich. They're just so beautiful. So we're justified by faith. That brings us to a place of peace with God through Jesus. Through him, we access faith, faith into the grace. We access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And then it's going to cause us to do nothing but rejoice in the hope of glory. Hope. Do we need hope when we die? No, it's too late. It's too late for hope then. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 through 9. This is speaking of rejoicing and hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, there that word is again, his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope. Not just a hope, a living hope, because the living Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom is alive inside you, gives you that hope, generates you, generates that hope for you. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the resurrection is, as I've said before, without the resurrection, you do not have, a, you do not have the gospel because Jesus had to have had power over death. Only God can do that. His abundant mercy has borne us, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the living hope to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Eye has not seen, nor hear, ear has not heard the things that he has prepared for those who love him. In my house are many mansions, he says. This inheritance we have, this living hope, never fades away. Romans 8, 37 through 39 talks about that. It's reserved in heaven. It's waiting for us right now. He sees us as a finished and complete work. Ephesians 1 talks about how we are seated in the heavenlies. From a justification standpoint, that is implying that we are now seated in the heavenlies. Bree, Brittany, I do that sometimes, sorry. No, that's over. Just kidding. <laughs> verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It should be on the notes. Let's hear it because sometimes you have to read it and hear it and see it and you get all your senses so you can really... It's like why Pastor Steve talks about why he takes notes, you know? I think it was Romans 8.37. Oh, well, okay, we'll go there. We'll go. I haven't read it, so, but we'll go there. But... No, 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 no. Okay, okay, hang on. So blessed be the God, and we'll go there afterwards. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us according to his mercy, who according to his, his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven, who are kept... By the power kept, I underline that. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. We're kept by the power of God through faith in which he gave you that measure of faith, in which you say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. 1 Timothy, again, 1.14, he gives you the exceedingly abundant faith. We're kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. You rejoice in the hope, as it just we just read in Romans 5, 2. Although now for a while, you, if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials. We're going to see that next in our text in Romans 5, being grieved by various trials and the purpose of them that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, beam a seat, right? Beam a seat. 
those works that, that are done of a pure motivation of, of the heart or that which is going to remain. And then the fire is also speaking of the fiery trials of, of the world that we go through on the temporal side of things, the beam of seat being on the eternal side of things. The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet by believing, yet believing, you rejoice with joy full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Faith, hope, and love, only love is eternal. So, Read 8, Romans 8. Let me see where I was. Yeah, it's um, really 35. Romans 8, 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are counted all day long. We are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's from Psalm 44. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is what I'm talking about, verse 38. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And that leads him to say, For I am persuaded that neither, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor the things that are go- that, nor things to come, things that are going to happen in the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember this: these two verses when. We talk about your homework for next week because it's this is a big part of it. So we rejoice in hope. Back to our text. We access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations. If you tell that to a non-believer, they're going to think you're a cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? Yeah. They're going to think you're absolutely crazy because it, it makes no sense from the natural side of things to glory in tribulations. Looking up the Greek words of tribulation, it speaks of pressing together, squeezing or pinching. You're being tried, you're being pressed together, you're, sque- you're being squeezed together knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, you have to be squeezed and pressed and pinched together in order for the fruit of that to lead to perseverance. Perseverance speaks of patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness. And perseverance, character. Can anyone define character for me? How, you, how would you describe character, anyone? The true meaning of yourself. The true meaning of yourself. Anyone else? I just like to hear while you guys just look at it. Thank you. I got to drink a coffee. <laughs> That's the real. I'm no, just kidding. Um, character, you've heard it said that Character is who you are when no one is around, no one is watching, right? The way it's defined, it's a proof. You know, like when you stamp in a proof of something. A specimen of tried worth. It's your mental and moral qualities. So that word character is the purpose of trials. That's why... 
you glory in tribulations. You go, Lord, thank you so much that my life is falling apart right now. <laughs> because I know, as everything we just read, that neither height nor depth nor any created thing, principalities, powers, things present, nor any things to come are going to separate us from you. We're more than conquerors in all these things. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit, which you've given me to have that glimpse of an eternal perspective, to understand that this is for your eternal good and your eternal purpose, that this trial that I'm going forward is, is fashioned by you. Not the circumstances, not my boss who's crazy or, or whatever it is that it may be that we're going through. Not by that. That's not what fashion. You ordained and allowed it to happen. And you are completely sovereign and in control. Thank you, Lord, for this trial that I'm going through. <laughs> it blows my mind because there's, I, I can think of things I've gone through in my own life and it, as we grow, there's a point where you're, you're just mad. You, mm, why? I've been going, I've been doing everything right. Why is this happening? Right? But in maturity, as we develop that perseverance, that character causes us, which leads to hope, as it says in verse 4, causes us to have just a calmness where we're not moved by it. And we just say, Lord, I know you're in control of this. So when you go, I think it's James that says this, when we go through trials, right, let it have its complete work, that you would be lacking nothing. Now that's rough. Emily's going, shoot, that's rough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let it have its complete work, that you would be lacking nothing. So it's not, it's not, Okay, so naturally, we want to get through the trial as fast as possible. So I think it's appropriate to say, Lord, help me to get what I'm supposed to get from this. Give me the obedience to walk in this. And so you want to be in that place of, of, of obedience and full submission to him in which you can get the fruit of that trial in which you're going through. And I, it makes complete sense to me that the sooner you learn it, the sooner you let the sooner you, you let it have its complete work, the sooner you're going to get through it. So, Lord, whatever, Lord, just, just what I'm, show me what I'm supposed to learn. And you might think you'll, something will come to your mind, and then there's, oh, yeah, that's what you're teaching me, Lord. I got this. This is going to be over soon. No, there's like different layers of depth mm -hmm. in what she's teaching you that. Step by step, you go in through one layer and then you see another and you just peel it. You know what I mean? Kind of like a rose, you get to the middle of it, petal by petal, or an onion, whatever the analogy you want to use. I don't know which is better. <laughs> Roses are more beautiful, onions are more tasty when they're cooked. Or I feel like there's even times in life where I've tried to dodge or avoid fully dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And it, you didn't get it with the right hook. Let me give you the left hook. You know what I mean? Because it's going to make you stronger. And all of that leads to hope, which we learned from First Peter chapter one, verses three through nine. Thank God through our Lord Jesus, who has begotten us to a living hope by His abundant mercy. We receive the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. That's the hope. So part of what trials go through, and you can see it in the Bible, I think Paul is probably the greatest example I can think of at the top of my head, right? That he had his eyes off of the guard he was literally chained to. It said that he would be chained to a Roman guard. And then you can read through Acts, it indicates that that's, that there were many Roman there were Roman centurions who got saved because they're chained to the Apostle Paul, you know, and he's writing the the prison epistles. He's in which he's commending people and thanking them for what they what they're doing in the body of Christ, 
in Paul's writings, you can see one of the things I love about Paul's writings, this is kind of an aside, that he mentions so many of the believers by name because every single person that he has come in contact with, which is, um, which is serving the Lord, has blessed him and he's thankful for their individual gift in the body. And he also mentions, I can't remember the dude's name, the coppersmith. He says, you, you did me much harm, right? Right? Paul remembered names, right? And he, while he's chained in prison, he's writing pr- the prison epistles. So that's definitely a trial. He even said when he was going to go, when he was called to go to Jerusalem, he said, I know this, nothing but, but chains and trials await me. So did he have the peace of God? when he's going through there. No, he had peace with God, but oh, God's given me a peace about it. I personally believe that, yes, God gives you a peace in certain situations, but sometimes he wants us to, to step out in faith. And we may not have, oh, I'm doing this because God gave me a peace. You may not have a peace, but it, he's confirmed it in other areas through his word, through other people them, whom you get counsel for, right? That's hope. That's character. That's perseverance. That's why we glory in tribulations. Verse 5. Now hope, <laughs> I should get choked up when I read this. It's so beautiful. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That hope that we have through all the, the pressing in and the, the squeezing, pinching of tribulations, it doesn't disappoint because God's, God's Spirit gives us love. That is the fruit of the Spirit, which is in Galatians chapter 5. Self-control, all those things. Self-control, all those things which all describe love. Rocky. Mm-hmm. I think in our trials, I think uh, what you and me, the Lord showed me through uh, uh, this, the Holy Spirit and through the, the pastor and stuff, is that when we're going through trials, there's an end. To realize there's an end. Like a carnival ride, it's real scary, you're going in it, and you're going to go up and you're all scared, but if there's going to be an end when you get off the ride, off the step. So to know that it's going to end, there's an ending to our trials. Is, is somewhat comforting. It's, it's, it's weird. Because the devil, or my flesh, wants to say, this is your life forever. Mm-hmm. You're going to be forever in this trial. You're going to get out of it. No, there's an end. So what is that? We just described it. What is that when you're looking towards the end of the trial? It's hope. That's hope, right? And when is the end? When God says that. So. What prescribed time does God allow us to go through trials? Can we find that in the Bible? It's in Proverbs 29, I think, right? Or Proverbs 32, I meant to say, right? <laughs> 32. I was thinking of February. <laughs> I'm on the wrong time schedule. We gotta find what God's time schedule is for the trial. Because we think it should end this at this point. No, no, no. He's got so Lord, what is your schedule? Yeah. What is it? So if we do that, it, it alleviates the pain of our trial. Yeah. So it is God has fashioned that trial for you individually for you, right? The Holy Spirit distributes the gifts individually as he wills, and God also allows trials to come individually as he wills. And the trial might be a week, it might be six months, it might be four years, who knows? And there's different trials. It's all part of him. So it's, it's, I like what you said, when does it end? But even much more than that, um, it's, what are you teaching me, Lord? Right. Because, you know, I like I appreciate what you said. When does it end? But it's it's really it's what are you teaching me? God sees the beginning from the end. He's interested in your heart, in refining your heart, 
in sanctifying and changing you to prepare you for eternity with him, which I believe he, is, he is, has specific things for us to do in heaven. We're going to be serving. I don't know. that. I've, and I've heard one person describe there'll be adventures in heaven. I don't know. But eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things he's prepared for us. We're definitely not up there like Bugs Bunny playing a harp on a cloud all the time. There might be. That would be cool too. Yes. Yes. Right? But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we're going to have trials until we're in heaven with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In me, we rest in him. What was that, John 6? Uh, 1633. 1633. In me, you will have peace. Go back. Hold on. One, go back uh, one chapter. Abide in him. John 15. Okay, so let's get back in our text here. I love it. Thank you guys for your contributions. So that's verses one through five. That's one section. We're justified by faith. God allows trials for him to, to develop hope. And in the midst of that hope, the Holy Spirit gives us love. That's one through five summarized in a sentence. Verse six for when, so for when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That due time speaks of the right time. The right time he died for the ungodly. Because when I read that, I'm like, in due time, what does that mean? You have to look it up. You have to look up the Greek and see what it's talking about. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Pastor Joe, can you read, you have King James, can you read it for us? Verse 6. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, does anyone have the NASB? It should say, if you don't, it's okay. Um, it says utterly helpless. I couldn't remember if it was the NASB or the, New King, or the King James. It says that. When we were without strength... The NASB, I love the way it, it renders it. We're utterly helpless. I know when I came to the Lord, I partied and I did, I won't go into my testimony right now because it's not about me, but I, I just partied hard, man. And I came to the end of myself and realized it was all futile and I was just utterly helpless. And when I came to that place of brokenness, I accepted him as my Lord. So when we were utterly helpless, at the right time, God died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. That doesn't make sense if you just read it in some ways. Why would you die sometimes for a righteous man, but maybe even more likely to die for a good man? So the way that righteous man is, is defined, it's a person who's precise, they're legally exact in the customs and rules. They're righteous, okay? A good man is like the guy that's going to help you move, who doesn't know you very well, and bring their pickup truck over, right? It's a person who's generous in heart, doing good to others, right? So scarcely you're going to die, a person would die for a righteous man who's who's very pious, perhaps, maybe pious isn't the right word, but they're very moral, they're very precise in their actions, their, their character is of good report. But perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In our sins, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his own love. That is how God's love is demonstrated for us. Because while we were ungodly, while our lives were at enmity with him, while we were in that sin, he died for us. Go to 1 John 
chapter 3. Verse 16. How do we know love? By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because he loves you, because that joy that was set before him, that he would spend all eternity with you. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Chapter 4. It is 9, verse 7, actually. Beloved, so we know God through love. Beloved, let us, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That I have. I highlighted it, and I wrote a little, like, like box around it boxes or what i was looking for box around it because i remember when we went through the distinctives of calvary chapel distinctives it talks about the supremacy of love and that just ministers to me to understand that god is love in this the love of god was manifested toward us that god sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, to be the atonement for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. John Gospel of John, chapter 15. Verse 13. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Any of you that are parents know that you would not hesitate to, to, I've told my daughter this, like if someone comes in the house right now, I will stand between you and the bullet, you know? When she's being a stinker, you know? You know what I mean? It's, it's, you won't hesitate to die for, for your child. That's the greatest of love. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for, our, for his friends. Back to our text. So, again, verse 6, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, God, Christ died for us. Much more, you're going to see that phrase, much more in verse 9, verse 10, verse 15, verse 17, and 20. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 15, verse 17, and verse 20. Much more. It, it reminds me of exceedingly abundantly. Much more than, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, reconciliation. Um, speaks of, I believe it says in the King James, it says, did you raise your hand? No, okay. That's okay. Reconciliation, in, like in verse 11, you'll see that word reconciliation. In the King James, it says atonement. Doesn't it, Pastor Joe? Verse 11, does it say atonement? Your last, the last word of, of verse 11? Yes. Atonement. 
in the King James. And I love how that's rendered there. We are reconciled. We are atoned for. We're at one minute. We're made at one. We're made one with God. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He's right now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, saved by his life. That makes me think of the resurrection. By his life, we're saved. The fact that he had victory over sin, that he overcame sin by his sinless perfection. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have the reconciliation. It's interesting the way this book is flowing. Um, just like to use an analogy, I've heard people talk about the book of Ephesians where you're like on the mountaintops and you're overlooking all the, the, the layout of the land of God's riches and glory. So in the first four chapters, we're like in the, we're like in the woods, right? The, the, the abundant, lush forest of God's righteousness and justification. And you're in all of that, you know, looking at all those nuts and bolts of the, of the theology of salvation. Here in chapter 5, you take a break from that, you're up on top and you're overlooking the whole forest. You know, it's just a beautiful picture that, that we're just, re, it just, Paul's saying, rejoice in the hope that you have. Yes? It says, if ye then were enemies, were enemies, okay, now we were enemies before we were saved against Christ. But as we carry these mortal bodies of flesh, sometimes the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, these enemies that still remain in, in this life, who probably walk with Jesus, is fighting the joy of God. It says right here, verse 11, and not only also, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I think the devil wants to use use our flesh to to water down that beautiful joy God's given us. Because look, it's not the lottery. The lottery will give you joy. That's an example of the flesh. The lottery. Or, hey, I'd rather be lucky than good. You, a lot of musicians say that. I'd rather be lucky than good. Because mm -hmm. you can make it you know, successful. Mm -hmm. Things true. You don't have to be great. You have to just the joy I'm trying to say is the, the, the flesh, our enemy that we used to be, we still, you know, we still have this, unfortunately, the body we've got to crucify. we still got to put it on I love, I love everything he's talking about because you're going to see that in Romans chapter 7, where the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. And then it talks about in Romans 8 that there's no condemnation if you walk according to Christ in the spirit. Mm -hmm. But it seems that for me, with the trappings and the things of my life, personal life, there's so many things that go, you know, hey, this is joy, no, that is joy. Mm -hmm. But no, no, we, I need to joy in God, just humble myself. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yep, in verse, verse 11. Yeah, like what he's saying. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read verse 10 again. For if when we were enemies were God, for, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, Romans 5, 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now have received the reconciliation. We have now received the atonement. So we have a ministry of that. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Remember that when the enemy shoots those fiery darts into your mind. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, what is the ministry of reconciliation? That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing, transferring to, accounting towards, their trespasses to them, not counting their trespasses to them, were counted as righteous, impute, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. When you're sharing the gospel, it's as though God is pleading through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Back in our text, from 12 to 21, the chapter switches gears a little bit, and you see the, the contrast between Adam and Jesus, right? That in Adam, through all mankind, spread death through Jesus, through all mankind, life is given. They were both born sinless, right? Jesus obviously remained sinless. And Jesus chose the cross. Adam chose to disobey. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this, but this puts a big onus on Adam when you talk about Adam and Eve. Chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 14. For Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Adam knew exactly, or you cannot account any of it towards deception. They both chose, but it says that the woman was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. It's more of a deliberate transgression in a lot of ways. So he wasn't deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Go back into our text. So through one man entered sin into entered the world, and death through sin, and thus, thus death spread to all men because all sin. For the law was in the for until the law, pardon me, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. So before the law existed, people died because of sin. So if you've ever been to an emergency room, everyone is in that room because of sin. Because sin is death. Sin brought, the consequences of sin is our bodies now decay and they get decrepit and we, they're wasting away, right? So before the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed, it was not accounted when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. What he's saying here is that the consequences of sin, you cannot say that, that there was no sin. People were not sinning because they did not know the law. It's saying they weren't, it wasn't accounted as sin, but it was still sin. Kind of splitting hairs a little bit here. It was still Sin, because death reigned. There is a consequence of sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, 
who was a type of him and who was to come. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the like of, likeness of the transgression of Adam. There's different ways that we sinned. Adam is a type of Jesus who is to come. We talked about that. He's a type of Jesus in one way in that through him, all humanity, through his choice, all humanity was affected. Through Jesus, all in humanity is affected to accept the free gift of salvation. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. The free gift of salvation is not like this. Jesus' free gift is not like the offense of Adam. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense, see, now we're kind of going back into the trees here a little bit here, as we were talking about before. You know what I'm saying? But, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, there's that much more again, for by one man's offense, many died, much more, exceedingly abundantly, more than what happened with through Adam's offense, overcoming that, because Jesus overcame the power of sin, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. You notice there's some words that keep coming up, abounding, right? Exceedingly, abundantly, abounding, overflowing to many. And the gift, salvation, is not like that which came through the one who, who sinned. Bear with me, I'll explain it. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for judgment came from one offense, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. What he's saying is you have the free gift and you have the offense. Here's how they're different. Here's how they're different. One resulted in justification. The other one resulted in condemnation. Here's how they're alike. Through one man on each side of the spectrum, it was imputed to, to it was counted to it had consequences for all all mankind. So they're they're different, obviously. They're on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Death and life. One resulted in justification, the other one resulted in ju judgment. And the, and the one that resulted in justification is a free gift. For if by one man's verse 17, for if by one man's death. Pardon me, for by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. That is, a, again, that goes back up on the mountaintop again and looks over everything, you know. That's very... Reminds me of stuff you read in Ephesians 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1, just a completely, just nothing but richness. So if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive, it is received, the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. That's what I remember when I was studying this. Righteousness is a gift. Will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors in him. Therefore, because of everything that was said beforehand, he concludes the chapter, therefore, as through one man's judgment came, pardon me, I keep skipping words, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free will, the free gift came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. So therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, and the result of that is condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all, resulting in justification of life. You'll see in the way that this is what one of the things I'm noticing as I'm studying Romans. He says the same thing from like five different angles. 
you know? Smart. You know what I mean? It's like if you have a teenager, you have to explain it to them from five or 10 or sometimes 50 different angles for them to believe you, right? You know? So what's that? One of them will work because we're, because we're stubborn and we want to hold on to things. He tells you from five different ways. You're, are you guys noticing that? Like he says the, the same idea, the same topic from three different angles. For by one man's of disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. He just said that, but he's saying it Again, so that he really wants it to penetrate to our brain. That is the obedience of Christ. This, this book is the theology of the gospel. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The purpose of the law entered that the understanding of what sin is, the knowledge of sin, because sin, is, the law is a tutor, a schoolmaster, understanding that this is now the standard. So when we understand what the standard is, sin abounds, because we now understand it's sin, and we prove that God has given us free will to go deep into that place of sin when we want to, right? He's given us a free will to choose that. Right? And that's our testimony, right? Casting off those works of darkness. He gave you the free will to do that because he loves you and he wants you to come to him because you had the choice. A full, unprevent, unadulterated choice, if you will. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Before we take a break, let's just look at this a little closer. So sin reigns in death. And he establishes here the fact that there was sin before the law. That our innate nature is to sin as he proved that in Romans chapter 3 that we're sinners all have sinned all have missed the mark all have fallen short of the glory of God right and that the consequence of that is death so even so grace reigns through righteousness that gift of righteousness that he gives us Grace reigns through that, leading to what? To hope, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're going to take a break now. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your grace. Um, just continue just to pour out your spirit and just bless our fellowship now. In Jesus' name, amen.